Okay. I think we're waiting for her. Why don't we to log back in? She seems to be having a technical challenge. Yeah. Hi, ladies. <laughs> How are you? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that just happened. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, so I was introducing Catherine. I don't know if you continued with the introduction. No, we didn't. I you also waited. dropped. I have no idea what happened. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh wow, okay, fine. Yeah. Oh God, please protect our time and what we are doing today. Oh dear. Okay, so I was introducing Kathleen and I said that we worked with her at ICRC and also she's passionate about helping people unlock their potential and limiting beliefs. And limiting beliefs are big and especially for us moms. We have these stories that we have put in our mind and we so believe them that we live we, every day of our lives, we live out our limiting beliefs. And so um, she helps people go past those limiting beliefs. But she's also an emotional intelligence coach. And so she's here wearing that hat um, and her expertise. She's also a leadership trainer. And more importantly, she bonds with us because she's a wife and she's a mom of uh, two children. One is a preteen and one is a teenager. But she'll tell us more about that as she goes on. Um, I'm sorry that we had to take a lot of your time, Catherine, but I'm still glad that all of you hung on, uh, said here there must be something awesome that you need to say that uh, the Wi-Fi and electricity do not want us to know. So take it on <laughs> and teach us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much, Marimo, for this invitation. I really, it's a pleasure to be able to share with other women. Um, I keep saying there are not very many forums we get where it's just women, you know, talking about things that are important to us because, you know, as moms, we wear very many hats and we're going to talk a bit about some of those hats. So it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Let me do, let me share my screen so that then we can be able to go through this together. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Oh, great. So we're going to talk about the emotionally intelligent mom, and we will do some definitions as we go along. But this is me. Um, I've been introduced. Um, that's what I do, and I will not repeat what has already been said. But um, what I would like to say is what I aspire for in my work is authentic living, that we may live more authentic lives, supporting people, especially women, to rise above limiting beliefs. Uh, I support organizations as well to be able to create positive workplace cultures. We're in the office, those who are employed full-time, eight to nine hours a day. Um, so how can that space be more positive? And then raising all-rounded and well-balanced children. Anybody who knows me or has had any conversations with me, all things children, I'm passionate about. Whether it's education, whether it's how are they balanced, what are they doing, I'm, I'm really, really passionate about how are we raising all balanced children that they're not just very academic and they lack all the other social skills or what, what kind of children are we bringing to society? So that I'm very passionate about. So that's me. My children are 13 and 10, 10 year, 13 year old girl and a 10 year old boy. Hello, Catherine. 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 So I dropped, and I think it was my internet connection that caused yeah, sorry. the drop. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. What I've done is switch to gadgets, but I need now to figure out how to share the screen. But okay. as I do that, um, hmm. I'd like you to think about the last 24 hours. 
and list down all the emotions you have felt during that period. You all have a pen and paper. Just think about the last 24 hours. What are the emotions you felt during that period? We done? With that? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. I think, I think I have an echo. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Is that better? That's okay. Okay. So, um, sorry. So, how many emotions did we list? I did four. <laughs> you did four. Uh huh. Who else would like to tell us how many they listed? I had six. You had six. That's four. That's six. Uh huh. I had four. You had four. Uh huh. I had three. You had three. Uh huh. I have eight. You have eight. Wow. Okay. So, um, I have no idea why today my gadgets are acting up, but no problem. So, we can't hear you, Catherine. Catherine, we can't hear you. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Sorry? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, you can with a little echo. Oh, I have an echo. Okay. All right. So, some had six, some had eight. Um, so, here is a list of many emotions. Just look at that list and see, are there any others in this list that you haven't included in your list? Just look at it and see, could there be more? And if there are, add them more. Add them more on a separate sheet so that you know how many more you have added. Are there more that you can see now? Any more? How many more have you come up with? Who would like to tell us? Confusion. <laughs> yeah. But in addition to the three or four, how many more are you able to add in terms of number that in addition to the four you had identified? Four for me. Four more. Uh huh. Anybody oh. else? Five for me. Five for you. Uh huh. Six for me. Six for you. Uh huh. Mm 
those are six more in addition to the ones you had before true yes yes true so why do you think that's the case how come now we we found a, a few more who can think why just unmute yourself and say why you think that could be the case I think for me, it's because now there are words to describe what I was feeling, I'm feeling. Mm. Yeah. There are words describing those feelings, so it becomes easier to articulate them. So, and that's what we want to talk about today. Are we aware of the emotions we are feeling moment by moment or day by day? And what are we doing about it? Because if you're not aware of it, then really you may not be able to manage it. So, and one of the examples I like to give, in fact, let me use, give that example before I even move there. I don't know whether um, some of you have read this story, it's, been, it's done, it's round on social media, is a lady gets a phone call from a friend of hers sitting in a restaurant and tells her, hey, I'm in this and this restaurant, I see your husband sitting here. And there's a lady with him and she comes out of the house, gets there. And when she gets there, she starts from downstairs. In fact, I always picture it, you know, those restaurants that are upstairs. She starts shouting from down there, you know, today I have caught you. You will see and you will, and she is so angry. Courses are seen everywhere only to get there and find he's seated with his cousin. Yes, what do you think that woman feels or that man feels embarrassed mm -hmm. embarrassed uh -huh. what else what else do you think she feels let's i would like this to be very interactive for us to speak with each other so what else do you think she feels Shame. Shame. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But can you imagine if she had just taken a minute to, before I come out there with all this anger and rage, even before I get angry, how do I know who this person is meeting? So that's what emotions do to us, that we have all these emotions going on, but what do we do about the emotions? So that's what today, I mean, I'm wanting us to think about and talk about that, you know, with all these emotions going on, what are we doing about them? And I want to change, um, I have two connections. So that's why my face appears like I'm looking another way because I have two connections. So, so what is emotional intelligence? So emotional intelligence is a set of skills that help us better perceive, understand, and manage emotions in ourselves and in others. So we perceive, we know what is that emotion we are feeling. We're able to identify it. And that is why I asked you about the emotions you have felt in the last 24 hours. And we are able to think about what am I going to do about this emotion I am feeling? So it's not a reflex action that, you know, I'm angry, I go storm in there, yelling, shouting, breaking things. No, that I actually make a choice in terms of how am I going to respond to that emotion. So, and collectively, being aware of the emotions, it helps us be, it helps us be more, it helps us be more stable people. It helps us be able to manage relationships better. So the importance of emotional intelligence for us, as women especially, because women, we are the ones who, our emotions run high and everywhere. We have times of the months when our hormones are all over the place. So how then do I get aware? What are the emotions I'm experiencing right now? What can I do about it? And how do I react? So that is what emotional intelligence is about. And your capacity to understand your emotions be aware of them and impact and how they impact the way you behave and relate to others then improves how you behave with people and how you relate with people. You, are there those people who you see them coming, you are like, oh, we, 
today. Don't do anything to, you know, uh, get this person off a wrong foot or you even have either siblings or it could even be parents where you're constantly thinking, where today you better watch out. I remember I used to have a boss once who people would actually look at what he is wearing and they are like, today he's wearing that sweater. So better get out of his way. I mean, when our behavior and our actions are dictated primarily by our emotions, then we are not able to be people who people can one, depend on, or people who people can know this is Wairimo. When I interact with Wairimo, this is what I will get. This is who Wairimo is. I have to then think, so what kind of mood will Wairimo be in today? So is today the day I should be talking to her? Is it not? So it's once we are aware of our emotions, how they impact others, how the way we respond to situations impact others, then we are way better in how we manage. And I'll give you a story. I like giving stories because they're practical examples. And we'll talk at this a bit about this because today I'd like to focus on how we parent and our emotional intelligence as parents. This is a true story of somebody I know. So this um, lady, she, her house help calls her and she says, uh, and she's a day bag, so she's left at four. And my friend thinks, okay, I need to rush home so that I can look after the children. She has three children, 10 year old. At the time, I think she was 10. Then she had an eight year old and a five year old. So she gets into her car to dash home, but she meets excessive traffic. In the process of all that, her, the power at her house goes off. So the 10 year old who, you know, thinks, but what do we do? We are afraid. She gets out with her other siblings and they go to the neighbors. They go to the neighbors and say, let's go and wait for mama, the neighbors. So the mother gets home and she freaks out. What does she think? The maid stole my children. That is the first thought in her head. The maid went with my children. And so she is panicking. She has, she called her husband. She is even about to call the police. Then she sees her children coming out of the neighbor's house. She runs. She was so afraid, but her reaction, she bit those children until they had to call the watchman to come and separate her from her own children. You see, she was happy to see them, but the fear that she had been processing of my children could have been stolen is what, she, uh, is what manifested at that particular instance. So what did she do? She complete, I mean, she rained on them like she was a mad woman. In fact, when she gives her the story herself, she bait up the children. I mean, the neighbor was so scared. The children were so scared. The neighbors came out because she was screaming and yelling as she's doing this. But when you think about it, she didn't do, she didn't set out to be mean and beat up her children or even not to show gratitude for her neighbor or to even show the joy at seeing her children. But the fear that she had felt, that is the emotion that came out first and that is what she reacted to. But when you think about that, think about a year down the road, two years down the road, when those children face another problem, do you think they will think, they will think let's go look for help? They won't. That neighbor, do you think that neighbor will be thinking your children can come to my house? See, that neighbor will be thinking, uh -uh, the way I saw you guys being beaten and the way I saw your mother reacting, ebuka ya nikoenyu, musikuja kuangu, so do you see how if we're not conscious and aware of our emotions, sometimes we may do things that actually end up, one, ruining relationships with others, but two, also then impacting people in a way that's negative. Because you can imagine the impact on those children. When she told me the story, I told her, you have to go, you have to sit your children down, you have to apologize which she did, but that fear that you have created in those children is going to be there for the long term. So, and that's what, when we react without thinking about our emotions, those are some of the things that happen. 
So, and why does emotional intelligence matter? This is actual research. It has proven that 80% of adult success comes from emotional intelligence. Not school smarts and all those things we went and did. The school smarts will get you to certain places. They will help you get certain positions. They may help you start certain businesses. They may help you, but 80% of success as an adult is how you relate with people, is how you talk to people, is how you interact with people, 80%. Because whether we work in an office or we are at home, even at home, we have all those hats. If we are running a business, we still have to interact with customers. We have suppliers. We have, I mean, we have a whole lot of people we interact with. Our emotional intelligence is actually the biggest determinant of success in our adult life. Not the school, not the high grades we scored in school. So as moms, so let's think about moms. Where does emotional intelligence come in? We wear very many hats very many we are moms some of us are wives some of us are employers so long as you have a house help in your house you're an employer so employer sometimes we think is this you know guy who runs an organization no if you have a house help or even somebody who just comes to wash your clothes from time to time and you're paying them you're an employer you have a tutor who comes to tuition your children you're an employer so you're an employer then we have, you're a customer, you go to shops, you go to places to buy things, you are a customer, you're a friend. There are people you interact with on everyday basis, you have friends, so you are a friend. You're a business owner, some of you, those who are doing business, you're a business owner, and maybe you're not a business owner, maybe you're a student. I had somebody saying you're in school, so you're a student. So you have several other interactions. You're a volunteer in church, or whichever other space, and you're a sibling or a daughter. Did I break up? Am I hanging? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> and, you're, and you're a sibling or a daughter. Now, in each of those, there's a relationship you're managing, there are people you're interacting with, and your emotional intelligence comes to play. I give you another. I give you an example of a of a wife and mom of where intelligent emotional intelligence comes to play. Let me give you one of a customer because sometimes they look very far removed. Um, one time I went to pick my clothes from a laundry in Harlingham, and I find this guy. He's got scratches on his face, and he's got you know like he has been in a cat fight. So I asked him as a joke. I said, "Eh, hey, ni mbaya." Nani kupiga, ulienda kupigana na mama usiku. And you know, he shocked me. He told me a customer came, we have, her clothes are lost. That was a female customer who did that to him. I mean, I sat there and I wondered what, what could have gone wrong? I mean, can you imagine you have come into a shop and you first are beating up the shopkeeper or the person who's selling? I mean, the shock, even the people around, in fact, it says it's the people in the next shop who helped because they came, held the woman back. I mean, and you're thinking, I mean, I'm not sure when she went home, what she was saying, today, this was my day. I beat up a man because they couldn't find my clothes. You get, so what I'm trying to say in this, that when we think about all the hats we wear, our emotional intelligence comes to play. And when he explained to me what had happened to that lady's clothes, I mean, really, it wasn't his fault. It was the owner's fault. The owner had done a mess and some of the clothes had been taken away by somebody who he owed money. But do you see how somebody just coming in, you don't want to hear what this person has to say. You just react with your emotions. It's my favorite dress. How can my favorite dress get lost? So you beat up the guy. Okay, so now you've beaten up the guy. Has the dress come back? Have you gotten the dress? No. But what has just happened? You have just, I mean, you're actually able to see emotions running somebody's life. And I say a lot of times, like in Kenya, one of the places I see manifest a lot in our country 
it's any time we're running up to an election or such. I mean, you see emotions that you're thinking, I, I thought I knew this person. What happened? So how aware are we of our emotions and how they play out? So emotional intelligence, the model I use, there are many models of emotional intelligence, but the one I use has six core competencies that you then develop as you develop your emotional intelligence. So the first one is self-awareness. How aware are you of yourself, your emotions, who you are, your awareness of others, authenticity, emotional reasoning. And you can see when you're authentic, people are able to see you as genuine or untrustworthy. That's all a factor of emotional intelligence. That person who comes and sits with you to tell you, hey, watch an equambien. I was with Wairimo. This is what is happening in Wairimo's life. That is a demonstration of low emotional intelligence. Because then you don't have, it's the emotional awareness that by telling this story about Wairimo, I am also hurting her feelings. So is that something I should be doing? So by just that awareness, you're able to be more authentic, more genuine in your relationship, and people can trust you. How aware are you? of other people's feelings. And it's in being aware of other people's feelings that then you can be empathetic or do you just not care? And I've seen it a lot in this COVID season and I, I don't know whether you can hear me, I look like I'm hanging. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, great. I've seen it a lot in this period of COVID. I mean that you're aware of others and how your actions impact them. And it could be just simple things. Simple things like we have house helps. And since we have house helps, I mean, they also are worried about their families. They are also worried about what's going on in their homes. And I mean, I've talked, had conversations with people who say, no, but given that she wants time off during this period, that's, I mean, it's, it speaks to your sensitivity to other people's problems that, you know, that's your problem, it's not mine. So how sensitive are we to other people's problems and how do we respond? So our empathy comes up and I can see my screen sharing has stopped. So let me hope it will connect again, but I'll just continue because um, I don't want to interrupt this again. Um, but you can hear me, can't you? Yes. 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 Okay. But the screen share I can see has stopped, but I'll just continue. Um, the, um, your self-management, um, sorry, your, your self-management, how well are you able to manage yourself? And in managing yourself, that's how you build resilience. Because self-management is being aware of what's going on, managing how I respond and how I react, and that then leads to my resilience, or I could be temperamental. And one of the verses I absolutely like from the Bible is the one that talks about uh, living in the house with a quarrelsome wife. It is like, it is better to live on the rooftop. Yani, can you imagine that it's better to live at the corner in a rooftop than to live in the house with somebody who is quarrelsome. I mean, that is just how serious it is when you're temperamental, people can't read your mood, people are constantly trying to figure out, is today the day when, you know, this person will chew us out. So just being able to be somebody who you manage self and therefore people are able to depend on you. You're able to be somebody who they're able to see, you're able to show up you're able to show up as a stable person. You're not all over the place. And the other one is positive influence, that you're an empowering person, that when you interact with people, they leave there feeling empowered. They don't leave there feeling wounded and hurt and bruised. And as moms, we inter from teachers, and I've seen that. I mean, I'll give you typical examples of teachers where I'll watch a parent interact with a teacher, and I'm sure Irimo can tell us this, she's been a teacher. I mean, there are parents who come and you wonder, I, 
but the teacher is with your child for just a few hours in a day. You can't come and yell at a teacher about a behavioral issue of your child in a manner that makes, you know, the teacher look like they don't know what they are doing. I mean, I'm sure by Remo you've, I'm sure by Remo you've experienced a lot of this. Yeah, very, there are parents who are extremely disrespectful and then they do it in front yeah. of their children. Yes. Yeah. So you're not able, even the positivity as you interact with interact in the school setup everywhere. People, you're that parent who the teacher sees coming, says, Ah, Mama Nani Amekuja, today is trouble. So how empowering are you and how do then people see you? So how do you show up? Emotional intelligence is really about how do you show up in the various spheres of your life? Yeah. So what is emotional self-awareness? So I'll go through each of those six competencies and just look at them. So what is emotional self-awareness? Is being aware of the way you feel and the impact. I can see some of you writing. Can I promise to send you this presentation? Then you will stop writing. That would be very so that you. Yes. Is that better? If I send you this, can we stop writing so that then we are all focused and listening? Is that okay? Yes. Great. Okay. So it's being aware of the way you feel and the impact your feelings have on decisions. And I've given you that example of the lady who went storming into a restaurant. And it's about us becoming present to the role feelings play in our, de in our decisions. Do we make decisions when we are angry? And what can we do so that then our decision making is not influenced by how we are feeling in that moment, but it actually is we are taking a more holistic approach in how we feel because sometimes, and I think we've all seen this where you say things, you um, do things, and later you're coming to apologize to say, boy, I'm sorry, I was, it was just in a time of high emotions and that's why I did it. So how can we learn to not just react when we are feeling high emotions? I went to school with a lady who told us about the way one time, I mean, she used to make fun and say her mother is the craziest person ever. And she used to tell us if her mother gets angry and she's holding a sufuria of food, you better run for your life because she will throw that sufuria at you. I mean, she, and then later, she's the same one to come check whether you got burnt, if your burnt took you to hospital. I mean, she gave us a story of ones where her mother actually um, poked her brother with a, you know, those old, uh, what are they called? The hangers, we used to hang clothes. She poked him. She had to take him to hospital to get tetanus, jabs to, I mean, and you're thinking, you react first, then later you have to come and do the damage. So emotional self-awareness is being present in how am I feeling? And what am I doing about what I'm feeling? Do I just act out my emotions? Or do I take the time? And we're going to talk about this in a few slides later. That What do you do so that you're not just acting out your emotions, that you actually are able to pause before you react? So your reaction is not a reflex action but it is a well thought out action, yeah? The other one is emotional awareness of others. Just being able to perceive, understand, and acknowledge how others feel. That is empathy. Empathy is really being able to, sen and, to and being able to be sensitive to how do others feel. When you dress down somebody, you know, and one of the people I see getting the brunt of this is house helps. Now that we are moms, so let me talk about how selves. I mean, in an organizational context, maybe I'd give other examples. But I mean, I've seen people yell and scream at how selves in a way that you're thinking, okay, na kesho utamka wache watoto wako na uyo house help. You know? And later, you then find your children disrespecting that same house help, and you're like, why are you disrespecting her? But, oh, what have they seen? So it's being aware, being empathetic, but sometimes it's just taking time to understand. Everybody makes mistakes. If a mistake has been made, understanding what happened. Or like the example I gave you of the laundry shop. Just understanding. So what happened? And the guy explained, oh, this is what the owner did. This. 
had that lady just taken the time to listen, to understand what is going on, she possibly wouldn't have been beating up the poor man. She'd have been looking for the owner of the laundry shop to demand her clothes. So our emotional awareness of others is us taking the time to understand others. And this includes our children. I mean, a lot of times we will yell at children, scream at children, all oh, they are doing, all oh, this is happening. But sometimes just taking the time to understand them, to be a little bit more empathetic you're then able to begin to see and understand things from their perspective. The other day I was looking at my daughter and it's, she had been on the phone having chats with her friends endlessly. And you know, I was like, okay, um, what's going on? And you know, and she said, you know, I miss my friends so much. So they just find ways, when can we talk? They are constantly looking for time to have phone conversations. And all we needed to do was sit, do a structure of, okay, but you can't be endlessly on phone. So how do we structure this so that you have time with your friends? Yes, I appreciate you miss them, but how can it be better structured? I could also have just said, you're on your phone too much. Give me that phone. You're not going to have your phone anymore. What results will I get out of that? But by explaining and then when I explain, and we're going to talk about that, then having boundaries around it, because emotional intelligence is about that, is then saying, so these are the rules, these are the boundaries. And if you're cross, there'll be consequences. But allowing that I have listened, I am aware of how they're feeling, and I'm able to then be more empathetic, be more understanding, allow for myself to feel what they may be feeling and respond accordingly. So that's the emotional awareness of others. Authenticity is openly and effectively expressing yourself and honoring commitments. I like the quote there, the core to authenticity is the courage to be imperfect, vulnerable and to set boundaries. One of the things as women, I think we face a lot is we grew up being told um, you need to be like uh, Usini Haibisha. I have no idea why endlessly. Us, don't embarrass me, Usini Haibisha. Even when you were told don't get pregnant, it was not because you were not given the reasoning of if you have sex with a boy, you will get pregnant. This is what it will impact your life. Most times it was Utatu Haibisha. What will people say about us? So what then happened, we have a whole group of adults and a whole generation of adults who are so concerned about what people say and think that we cannot be authentic. So we are packaged according to what we feel is the right way. But authenticity is about being honest, expressing yourself freely, sharing your emotions and how you're feeling, being genuine, and that people can trust you. That the Wairimo I see, is very more. I mean, she's not packaged so that I see her in a certain way. Emotional intelligence helps us be authentic because then you realize I can share of myself. There are people who will accept you the way you are. There are people who won't. But when you openly, uh, openly express yourself, when you're freely expressing yourself, when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it's true. There are those who will be comfortable with it. But at the end of the day, you're a happier person, you're a more balanced person, and you're not racing to be like somebody. You're yourself, and you're happy in your skin. It doesn't matter what the neighbors are doing. It doesn't matter what other... It's fine. It's okay. And you can be yourself. So that's what authenticity speaks to. The other one is emotional reasoning that you're able to use the information from yourself and others when making decisions. So you're able to, you don't, you're not a know-it-all. You have the humility to be able to listen from others. You're able to gather facts before you make decisions. And this leads to you being able to make more creative, expansive thoughts. You know, you're able to make well thought out decisions. And I'm sure, any of you who is in any group of women, I mean, where you're able to share thoughts, the share ideas, you find you're able to improve each other, you're able to build each other. 
But the minute we want to be the person who knows it all, then we then become, yes, the know it all, but we limit ourselves to how much more could we have known and how much more, how much better could those decisions have been made had we had, had if we had had the humility or been in the emotional space where we are willing to listen to others. The other one is self-management. This for me is one of the ones I find, I always say it's the most important because this is about how we manage our own moods, emotions, time, behavior, and how are we constantly improving ourselves. Whether it's at home, whether it's when we interact with people, how we manage ourselves then determines everything else. And it's, I mean, I, if you look at this tree, this tree has interpersonal skills, it has productivity, initiative, your integrity, your confidence, analytical skills, continuous learning, because then you realize you never know it all, communication, resilience, honesty, flexibility, all those are factors of how you manage yourself. Because it's in you effectively managing yourself that you're able to build interpersonal skills. You're able to relate better with others. You're able to solve problems because you're able to seek solutions for problems that arise. You don't just go based on this is how I feel and you go, you're, a, you're able to take the time to acknowledge this is how I'm feeling. I am afraid right now, but what do I do with that fear? So you don't act out of fear, but you take time to first reflect on, okay, so the emotion right now is fear. And the fear could lead me to make decisions that may not necessarily be productive. So how can I do it differently? And I think a lot of times, and especially as parents, sometimes fear pushes us along in a lot of ways because we're so afraid for our children. We are, we're afraid for, you know, we need to be able to provide for them. Fear sometimes makes us make all sorts of very wrong decisions. So how, by managing ourselves, how can we better manage ourselves so that even in the decisions we make, whether it's about ourselves or about our children, they are actually informed, not by our emotions, but by a well thought out uh, process, yeah? So our moods, these are very infectious. I mean, I say mothers set the mood in the home. So what are the mood? What is the, what is the mood you bring in? What are the emotions you bring into the home? And I'm not saying that we don't feel these emotions, but it's then being aware of this is how I'm feeling, and therefore, how do I behave so that then I don't dampen the mood in the house for everybody? That you're able to lift the mood in the house. I mean, I see it in my own house. I mean, on a day when I'm so tired, I just don't feel like engaging or having conversations. And I mean, and I'm just quiet. I realize everybody then just keeps quiet. But the days I have high energy and and you know, I'm active, I'm suggesting games, let's do, you find everybody else gets onto, the, onto that bandwagon of let's do. So a lot of times I've come to realize that from experience. As a mom, you set the mood and you set the tone in your own house of how things will be done. The next one, I have no idea, to, sorry. The next one is positive influence which is influencing the way others feel through problem solving, recognizing and supporting others. And a lot of this, I see this playing out a lot, especially at home, influencing how even children, um, are you constantly backing out commands that your children saying you need to do? How are you creating a supportive environment for them to be able to discover themselves, for them to be able to learn new things, for them to be able to try out new things and you allowing that space for them to do it. So it's about you being able to influence others, but you can only do this if you have a positive, it's a positive outlook you have. You communicate from whether it's verbal, whether it's through your body language, whether it's through your actions, that it is okay. I'm allowing a safe space. I am encouraging you to do, you are, you, collaborate and you stretch them. So as a mom, it's a 
black women to children and for as I have seen working many years, is you find children who are super bright, super, super bright, and they scored very high marks in all their, all the way through high school. They went through school, did, and of course you all know about our education system and how that goes, and you know they crammed, they passed exams, but also at home, they never got the opportunity to stretch themselves and try new things. So what happens? They have no idea. They need to be told, even as they get into workplaces, unless you tell them, they can't do. And I remember having a neighbor who we had this discussion with once. She had a daughter who was 16, and she was just telling me the way. I mean, for her, she wasn't seeing it as a problem. And she says, You know, I need to make breakfast for my daughter before I go to work. I need to do. And I said, Okay, I hear you, but your daughter is 16. Why can't she make? She says, Aki Ajui Kupika. She will she will starve. She won't know what to do. I mean, do you see that is it's not even the child who is saying I can't do. It is you, the mother, feeling I need to control. It is you're feeling the need to. You know, like it's almost like cover that child, like you know, I'm completely protecting you, but you're not encouraging them, you're not stretching them, you're not allowing them the space to grow. And past emotional intelligence actually allows you to do that. You begin to reason around what am I building, what am I doing, what will this action result to, and therefore you make choices that allow you to help your children grow, not just academically, but as human beings who you're going to let out in society in a few years. So what are those actions you're taking and what informs your actions? And a lot of this, the positive influence, the ability to empower others and motivate others all is all part of your emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence goes beyond just the emotions you feel, but it's also being able to think through what are my actions producing? And what does that mean for my family, for the people I interact with, for my even extended family? What does that mean? So being able to have a positive influence. And that just sums up the competences of emotional intelligence. And I want us, the focus I wanted us to have today, and I know I've talked a lot, wherever uh, you will keep telling me when I'm running out of time. And some of the, one of the things that is, I'm passionate about, and I really thought was an important topic for us to talk about today, is how do we parent with emotional intelligence? And why is it even important at all to us as parents? Remember, one of the things I say is you can only pour out what you have. So if you're an emotionally intelligent parent, you're likely to pour that out into your children and be able to raise emotionally intelligent children. You cannot pour out something that you don't have. You cannot say, do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. Most times, they do as you do, not as you say. You may say all sorts of things, but most times, they will do what you say, what you do. So to be able to raise children with high emotional intelligence, we ourselves need to develop high emotional intelligence. And so this is my question to you. When you think about your children, and I'm hoping everybody here is a mom and has children, what, what kind of people do you want them to be? What's the dream of the kind of person you want them to be? Career, employment, not a consideration. Don't tell me you want a doctor. Mm -mm. Not doctor, not engineers. You know those careers we all, everybody thinks of, I want them to be a doctor. As a human being, what kind of person do you want your child to be? As, an, as a young adult, as an adult, what is that? What is that that you want your child to turn out to be? And I'd ask one or two people to just share with us. You can even type it out in the chat. What are those things that for you are important that when your child is an adult, you're able to say, this is what I want to see my child turn out into. So let's, two people, three people, just tell us what are some of those things that you think are important.
Wairimu, you can read out to us anything that's in the chats or anybody can unmute themselves and say. Yeah, Caroline has written independent. Independent, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hannah what says else? to be to be able to make decisions for themselves. Uh -huh, to be able to make decisions. And Anna as well says she wants her children to be independent and strong. Uh -huh, independent mm -hmm. and strong. Uh -huh. Carol says resilient as well. Resilient. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. For me, um, one yeah. of the top top things for me is that as siblings, they love each other and they are kind to each other even as they grow old. Yeah, love. Rosemary says yeah. responsible. Responsible. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. To add something. Carol wants to add something. Yes. Uh, okay. I think for me, I would love to see that. Uh, that they turn out, you know, those things we, I keep teaching them that they can be able to handle life on their own and uh, much uh -huh. more to the foundation of faith and also uh -huh. to be leaders and uh, uh -huh. empathetic over and above what I also mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I like all the points you've shared. But when you think about it, we invest a lot in our children. We pay school fees. We pay tuition teachers to come and teach them. They get high grades. They get A's. And does, do those grades teach them empathy or how to be responsible or how to be resilient? Because they go. They learn science and biology and whatever, whatever other subjects they may learn. But does that teach those skills? So if the school system is not designed that way, who is going to teach those to our children? Because the school system is not designed that way. Our school system is so designed towards passing exams, getting children to get A's, getting children to see who was the highest, you know? Competition that, you know, I keep saying our schools create competition that's unhealthy, you know that Every day, there are schools which have a system where every week we do exams and we rank number one to number last. The next week we do, so you're constantly trying to outcompete the other. Is that system teaching kindness? Is it teaching empathy? Is it teaching about caring about others? It's teaching about you get ahead at whatever cost. Don't be worrying about these others. You, you need to be ahead. So. These are the skills, independence, being able to make decisions, resilience, loving each other, kindness, handle life on their own, faith, leadership, empathy. Who's teaching our children those things? Where are they learning them from? And I like this quote, it says, raise children with care and raise children that care. And one of the things I remember, and this was a conversation, some, I mean, a teacher was having with parents and just trying to talk to parents uh, at a school during one of those many election seasons we have. And the conversation the teacher was, was having was about comments the child had been making in class, said, the, t the child says this and this and this about a different, another tribe says these people are like this and like this. I mean, and the teacher listened clearly. Where had that child had that from? And it's not that the parents intended to teach him that. They maybe were watching news and as they were watching news, a comment just came off. Awawatu, kinanani, you know, and that child picked up that comment and that child grows through life with that stereotype in their mind. So even as we talk about old oh, tribalism, we talk about racial, like what's been going on in the US over the couple, last couple of months, a lot of it has to do with we parents, what are we instilling? And a lot of times we say, oh, I'm taking them to church. It's okay, they'll go to church and hear what is being preached and they will do their Sunday school lesson. 
but the biggest lessons are what you demonstrate to them at home. When you disrespect the house help, what that child learns is there are people it is okay to disrespect. That I can respect some people because they also see people who come to your home and you respect them. But there are people who it is okay to disrespect. When you go to a place and you yell at people and you shout at people and you know, maybe it's a shop or whatever, what lesson has that child learned? So it's, we, they go to school and there's all these things they are learning in school, which are important and they need them. But who is teaching our children? These are the skills that we need for them to be successful in society. If we are saying that 80% of success research has proven is on emotional intelligence, only 20% is on school smart and the A's they scored. So who's teaching your child the 80%? that they need to learn for them to be successful in life and in society. Who? So we have a big role. And unfortunately, I don't know whether it's unfortunately or fortunately, the biggest teacher in the home is the mother. It's, you spend the most time with your children. It is mothers who are most present with children. You are the biggest teacher of your children. So how are we molding and shaping our children? What behaviors are they seeing of us? Are we demonstrating emotional intelligence so that even them, they're looking and saying, yeah, this is how we behave. This is, and teaching them to be aware of their own emotions. You know, when I see children throwing tantrums and rolling in the supermarket floor, I'm like, I could, you could take that child and chopper them, that's, you know, pinch them so that they stop. But when did you, there's a lesson there that you've just missed. You've pinched them, stop crying. But there is a bigger lesson that you need to teach at home even before we get to the supermarket so that I don't have the rolling on the floor. So who's teaching that? And I mean, children are very perceptive. You can start to teach those things from a very young age. So... Some of the things that influence how we parent is there are many different parenting styles and sometimes it's to ask ourselves what is our parenting style and fortunately or unfortunately our parenting style is influenced by so many things. It's just like our emotional intelligence. There are so many factors that could influence how emotional intelligence we are. So how do you parent and what are the factors that influence how we parent? Some of the factors that influence is how we were parented ourselves. A lot of times you find if you are yelled at and screamed at and unless you're consciously aware to change that, you're likely to do the same. It's being, I'll tell you about myself. I, I did not grow up in a home where, I mean, our parents provided for everything we need, but there was no affirmation. And when you did something wrong, you were beaten, but nobody sat and told you, this is what you did wrong, and this is why you're getting that punishment. So, or you were told, I don't want to see you with so-and-so. I don't know why I've been told not to be seen with so-and-so. I've just been told, I don't want to see you with so-and-so. So nobody at that time took the time to tell me uh, the reason I don't want to see you with so-and-so is because of A, B, C, D. So our parents, I mean, and I've talked to a lot of people who grew up in my generation. The parents were, I am the law. I read out the law and you follow the law, no questions asked, no discussions. So for me, when I became a parent, I was very aware that I have no clue how to parent effectively. And I went for a parenting class. I mean, and I tell you, it was one of the, I mean, it was one of the best things I did for higher history because then I even begin to understand how do I discipline? Because I want to discipline, but I don't want to discipline in the same way as discipline. I'm not sure whether we were disciplined or punished. I keep having that. I, sometimes I just think we were just punished because there was no lesson you got out of it. All you were told, and you're beaten plus all your siblings for something one did. But that, it influences how we parent today unless we are very conscious and aware of it. Cultural influences. Where did, what were the cultures that influenced? You told in our society, in our culture, or things that you have seen, they actually influence how we parent. Baggage that we carry. This one is a big one for women. 
there's a lot of baggage sometimes we carry and the baggage could be insecurity it could be because the minute i'm insecure as a person i pass on that insecurity to my children the minute i'm fearful as a person i pass it on and those insecurities and fears could be caused by real things that have happened to me but how do i acknowledge that deal with it and be able to move forward from it last weekend i i, I listened to at, I, I actually watched it was um it was uh, it was on youtube it was by dr Betty doctor by simon bevy and they were talking about daddy issues you know and how daddy issues have affected and i mean i listened to some of the things that they talked about and you find a lot of that baggage that people have carried because of an absentee parent or because of a parent who was cruel or because of maybe you watched your mother being uh, abused or so there's a lot of baggage that somebody then carries and that baggage influences how we, par we parent and past experiences that have created certain things in us. so how do we parent because and one of the biggest things and that's why emotional intelligence one of the core things in emotional intelligence is self-awareness and then self-management being self-aware of how was I parented and how does that influence how I parent? What are some of the cultural influences that influence how I was brought up and how is that acting out? It's being completely aware of yourself, your own emotions, your own patterns based on things you have gone through and how do those affect you? What's the baggage that I carry and how is that influencing me? So, those are factors that then influence how we parent and in so doing they impact how we are raising our children and whether we are able to raise emotionally intelligent children so there are four basic um parenting styles there could be more there are people who talk of more but they border on these four so there's the four are this, the authoritative, who is relational and respectful. The authoritative parent is able to set boundaries, have rules, but still create a loving and warm environment. So you have, you will discipline your children. One of the things I remember learning from Dr. Mukolwe, that's the parenting class I attended, was when you discipline, first explain what, why. I'm giving you this spank I'm giving you. Then do the discipline. And even then, the infraction has to be commensurate with the discipline. Then restore the relationship quickly. That once I have disciplined you and we are done, I can't be angry with you for the next three hours. We need to restore that relationship. You know, hug, it's okay. You know, and we move on and affirm. So being able to do that i mean for me that was a completely foreign concept but with practice you get there then there's the authoritarian parent i don't know whether others were raised by such parents but i think a lot of our parents were that you do what i say no questions asked i said end of story you could never ask why i look at my children today say but why i'm like her i keep telling them if you ever asked my mother that and they can't believe it. They say, but she's so nice. You mean she used to be so harsh with you? Well, uh, but the authoritarian parent is the parent is boss. So if you're looking at raising children who can make decisions, children who are independent, children who are responsible, yet every day you're the one saying, making decisions for them, you don't give them room to think, uh, believe me, you're working against yourself. So you have very high expectation. This is the parent who your child comes home. In fact, this is yet another guy who was sharing with us last week. He would come home with 95%. And the father would ask him, and what happened to the other five? He won't first say you did well. Mm -mm. It is what happened to the other five. And he talks about being a very bright student. He was in alliance, very bright. But he says he had such insecurities because he was always looking for approval from his father. He had to deal with that as an adult. In fact, he says he went for therapy because he realized he is so insecure in everything because 
I mean, the expectations were so high, he could never meet, and he was constantly trying to please. And he then found, even in real life, he became a people pleaser because you just want him to be accepted. So that's the authoritarian parent and how the authoritarian parent typically behaves. Then the permissive parent. This permissive parent, and this is, this is the biggest these days in our culture. We have this thing of, oh, my parents were so harsh, I can't be like that. So you're so indulgent. And the child can do whatever they want. And I have a lot of conversations with parents saying, oh, but what do I do about, oh, but my child, I mean, I'm like, okay, but... You bought the phone. If the phone has become a problem, see, I just take it away. See, I bought it. And I will explain to you I'm taking it away. But we, we're so afraid of hurting the children that we don't set boundaries. And the minute you don't set boundaries, you cannot raise a balanced child. There must be boundaries. There must be established boundaries of how we behave, how we do things. So it can't just all be you know, everything is okay, everything goes so long as you're happy. You will not get that person, that independent person, that strong, resilient person, no, because they won't find resilience. Why? Anything I wanted, I got. So it's being able to learn to say, mm -mm, it doesn't work like that, and you explain the why things work the way they do. So that's the permissive and indulgent parent. Then there's the uninvolved parent. These ones are, you're so busy, you're everywhere, you have no time for your children. So you have low expectations, you're not present, you have, again, absentee parent, we all know the effect of absentee parents. So what kind of parent are you? And sometimes it's reflecting back on how was I parented? How has it impacted me? And today when I think about this, what kind of parent am I? So can I ask you guys, what kind of parents are you? Do you see yourself here? Which one are you? How many are authoritative parents? They are relational, they are respectful, they set high expectations and standards. How many are authoritarian? You know, I'm the boss. I say you do. Don't ask me questions. Who is the one who is anything goes? Oh, well, yeah, don't cry. It's okay. What did you want? You know, when the child rolls on the supermarket floor because they wanted chocolate, you buy the chocolate. So what happens tomorrow? See, they have lunch. I roll on the floor, I get the chocolate. So in fact, now the child is training you. It turns around. It's the, you know, I roll, I scream, I get what I wanted, you know? So what kind of parents are you? Would anyone like to tell us? Or would anybody like to put in the chat? There's, we are all women, so nothing to be embarrassed about. So anybody want to tell us what kind of parents they see themselves as? For me, I'm, uh, I would say I'm more team, but I still oscillate to authoritarian. I have those times uh -huh. I go to the yeah. Okay. So you see yourself doing both. Yes. Okay. Depending with the emotions. <laughs> <laughs> the emotions at that time. Uh huh. Yeah. Who else would like to tell us? Or even tell us how you were raised. Maybe you were raised by a permissive parent and how that has impacted how you parent. So you could tell us either way, whether it's how you parent or how you were parented and how that has impacted you. Hello. Yes, Rosemary. Yeah, me, uh, my experience, I was raised by one authoritative purely. And I think that has um, really also impacted on how I parent. Mm -hmm. um, I find myself losing my cool very often and preferring to lash out or to use a cane which uh, is work in progress to try and be the democratic and relational parent. That is, that is actually what's my journey I want to achieve. So mine was purely authoritative, yeah. Mm. yeah. But I want to make a difference in, and I, in and my own. Yeah. 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 And it's true, how we were parented really impacts us, but it's not 
uh, I completely believe in the verse, spare the rod and spoil the child. So it's not spare. I mean, we don't get rid of the rod. It is that by the time I'm giving you the rod, I have given you a warning. We have had a conversation about what you have done. And we've had a conversation where there's no yelling. We've had a conversation of what you have done and why it warrants that. And we then are now doing, is it one or two kibokos? And after that, we seal the relationship. And very sincerely, I must say, my children now, I don't remember in the last, I could almost say two years, having conversations of discipline. With time, they get the hang of, so what is important? What are the boundaries in this house? And I remember when they were younger, I had it on a big manila paper. These are, these are the do's and don'ts in this house. And you know, if you break this, this is the consequence. And with time, people get into the rhythm. So even as they get into teenagers, you know, um, I'll give you an example. We had a conversation with my daughter about the phone shall not be near your bed at night. And if the phone is next to your bed at night, because then I don't know whether you'll wake up at night and begin um, surfing on the net, I'll take away the phone for two days. Finished. A very sober conversation. The next day, I come, I find the phone there. There was no conversation. In fact, I didn't even say anything. I just said, give me the phone. She knew why. I took the phone. No conversation. After two days, we had a conversation about the why. Why did I take the phone? And I tell you, that was, I mean, that was, I think it was just when this COVID was starting. I mean, it's herself. I don't have to remind. She knows where the phone is kept at night. In fact, it's kept in the sitting room. She goes, she lives up there and she'll pick it up in the morning. So it's having very clear boundaries and consequences to that boundaries. That I don't need to scream or shout. It's clear. That is the infraction. This is what happens and the reason why it is important. So we'll even have the conversation around why it's not, why you shouldn't have the phone there. So those are important things that we're not just um, being cognizant of this is how I would typically behave because of what I was exposed to and therefore how can I do it different? Yeah, anybody else want to share? Oh, Warimo, I can see I have exceeded the time by far. Okay, I will wrap it's up. Okay. <laughs> um, so, and this is the truth. Research has shown that children with high emotional intelligence, one, they perform better in school. They make healthier choices. They are less likely to smoke, get into drugs. Teachers report that students with high emotional intelligence are more cooperative, make better leaders in the classroom they are more likely to be the ones who are prefects. They're the ones who are likely to be pulling the other students together to do positive things. It's been found that there's a relationship between emotional intelligence and bullying. And there are schools that have actually introduced emotional intelligence education as a way to prevent bullying. Because then the, as, you, as you demonstrate the emotional intelligence, you're able to teach the same to your children and they actually are able to demonstrate it in the interactions. So it's, it doesn't start with, I need to teach the child. It starts with me demonstrating it and therefore then the children being able to demonstrate it. So I'll move quickly. I have just like two more slides. But how do we then grow our emotional intelligence? It's being self-aware, understanding your personality, Understanding the baggage you carry, this is so important. What is the baggage I carry and how is that influencing me? And a lot of the baggage I carry, is it baggage from how I parented? Is it baggage from things that happened to me? Just uh, digging into what is that baggage I carry? What are past experiences that may have impacted me negatively? And how are those influencing me? So being completely self-aware, and understanding that I behave this way because of A, B, C, D. Then learning to manage that. And sometimes you could find the baggage you carry from the past needs professional help and that you look for it. Sometimes it could be that you need, if you're a Christian, that you pray and you ask God to just help you move from that space. Or even being able, sometimes it's insecurities, just being able as a woman to know what does God say about me? Who am I? And what is my relationship with God? And therefore being able to extend that even with your children. 
So learning to manage your emotions. How do you learn, manage your emotions? There's a guy called Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was in the concentration camps during Hitler's time. And one of the things he said is that, I mean, they could take away all your freedoms, all freedoms they were able to take away. But he says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So between the thing that happens or the emotion that you're feeling and how you act it out, there's a space. And that space, it's only you who can create it. It is you making the choice of, I will not react in anger. I will take, you know, we kept being told count up to 10. I never knew why we, now I understood when I started to learn about emotional intelligence, about taking a deep breath, counting backwards from 10, because the minute you bring that thought into perspective, you won't react in anger. You now are able to react more rationally and have a conversation. You're, you won't lash out. Why? Because you have thought about uh, what am I, I mean, yes, this is how I'm feeling, but what does it mean? Or why am I feeling this way? And how then do I act? Because at the end of the day, you want a certain result. How do you get that result? If I yell and scream, have I gotten what I wanted? Possibly not. So how do I create that space? And it's figuring out what for you enables you to create that space. Is this counting one to 20? Is it just walking away and coming back to that issue later? Is it finding ways to journal and be able to offload your feelings somewhere and being able to reflect on the things you do? You, if all of us are different, but what is that thing that will help you create a space between whatever has happened or the emotion you're feeling and the response you give so that then whatever reaction you do or whatever action you take, it's not a reflex action, but it's a thought out action. So figure out for you, what is it? Do I need to be counting to 20? Do I need to take three deep breaths? Do I need to tell somebody, okay, give me five minutes, I'll be back. And in the five minutes you walk away and then you come back after the five minutes to look at it. So what is that? How can you be able to grow and extend yourself, extend your emotional responses by just learning to manage the emotions you feel, being aware and learning to manage them. And like I said before, mom sets the tone. What you do matters. You can never be too loving to your children. It can never happen. You can never hug them enough. You can never say, I love you enough. You can never teach enough. You can never affirm them enough. Be involved because it's in being involved that they see how you behave, how you live out, and they're therefore then able to do the same. Then adapt your parenting style to fit your children. I have two children who are completely different. One of my children is very sensitive. So if you're even a little harsh with him, you see him just covering in. While the other one could come with you toe to toe if you allow it. So it's being aware of your child and adapting your style to fit your child. Even as you teach the lessons, what's my child's personality and therefore what's the most effective way to teach this child? You know, there are those children who, their mothers who tell you they're true. In fact, there's a lady who told us, her son told her, I mean, so if you realize that is your child who tells you Chugu eh, that kid, figure out another way to punish. So adapt your style to fit your child, establish and set boundaries. That's how you raise children who are emotionally intelligent because the world out there has boundaries. So find ways to set boundaries, foster your child's independence, and then be consistent be consistent in what you do and how you feel. And when you do, and sometimes you will sleep and fall and not to beat yourself about it. I yelled today and I sit and we say, okay, I yelled, I shouldn't have, but this is what, I mean, this is what happened and this is how I was feeling. So, but, but still finding the opportunity to teach the lessons, teaching the life lessons to our children becomes very important that even if we sleep, we do things we shouldn't, we're able to circle back and say this was the right thing to do, yeah? Avoid harsh discipline, 
set boundaries. Uh, I gave the example of one of the ways Dr. Mukolo taught about how to discipline. And for me, it has worked. It has actually worked. Um, and then explain your rules and decisions. I told you I had a chat in my house that had rules and you know, and you knew what is the rule, what is the infraction. And then treat your children with respect. If you don't treat your children with respect, please don't expect them to treat anybody with respect. It is the, what your model is what they do. So you need to demonstrate those behaviors for them to be able to demonstrate those behaviors to the outside world. And I like this verse in Proverbs, that the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish one pulls it down with her own hands. So which woman are you? Are you the wise woman building your house? Are you building the emotional intelligence of your children? Are you building, are you having a clear picture and a clear vision of the kind of children you want, the kind of adults you want these children to be? And therefore laying the bricks layer by layer. This is the brick I'm laying. This is the brick I'm laying. This is the brick I'm laying until we get to that final brick of the people who you want them to be. Yeah. And finally, this is my parting shot. The children are given to us by God as a gift. So we'll look at it as a seed God has planted. Our work is to nurture, is to ensure the environment is right, is to ensure that there is sunshine. The same way a plant is. A plant needs sunshine. It needs water. It needs manure. It needs, that is how a plant grows. And after that, the plant grows and it will bear good fruits if all the conditions set were right. So that's the same thing. God has planted these children in our care. So how will we nurture them? How will we water? How will we put manure? How will we make sure there's enough light? How will we make sure we are pruning and weeding so that at the end of the day, we have a tree that bears fruit or we have a child that bears fruit or we have a child that glorifies God in everything that they do. So that is my parting shot. And that is me. My last slide is really just me, what I do. I coach and train on self-awareness. I actually do personality profiling, if anybody was ever interested. I do coaching and training on emotional intelligence, including assessments on how emotionally intelligent are you. I do training on leadership, leadership training for organizations, and I train on team effectiveness. I won't belabor this because of time, but my contact is there should anybody want to get in touch with me. And now I can take any questions or comments. And I'm sorry for going over time, Wairimo. It's okay. The discussion and the topic that you are taking us through demanded that we don't interrupt and you listen to every point. I hope, moms, you enjoyed that and it's triggered some thoughts and areas of improvement. Maybe we can hear some feedback and some questions, please, for Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. An excellent presentation. I couldn't have understood better emotional intelligence from a number of forums, but it was so spot on and uh, relatable. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you manage um, the, uh, the way you just talked about personalities of children? Sometimes they keep also oscillating. So I find, for instance, my son, he's very courageous. Uh, you'll see he, he hates to do wrong, but at times when he does it so wrong, okay, he will go extreme again. And then when you spank him, it's like he, you know, he curls completely, but, but he's not that, you know, he's not that timid person. So I'm caught between now, is it that I now stop being, you know, that one of, no, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, what do you call it, like, no, I'm laid back. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you have said it so many times. So it's been it's been something that has just happened in a few weeks. So I'm I'm a bit trying to find my way in terms of discipline and also setting the rules because I have set them, but but you will still go through the same thing. But it it it's I think it's troubling me how he's really curling. You know, he curls like you know just a small thing. It's it's really yeah. making me a bit worried. Yeah. My, I have a son who's like that, who's very sensitive and when you punish him, it is like the world has ended. Or when he now, I also, I mean, I also realize that looking the other way doesn't help me if I don't then punish.
punished because that's what is going to happen. But I found then for him, the conversation after the discipline, the conversation and affirmation after the discipline is possibly a lot more than with my daughter because he calls back. So I need to affirm him more once it's done as to why and why I need him to do things and why he needed to get that discipline and just reassure him of, I love him, hug him. And I found that part now just helps. But so they're different because he's very sensitive, but um, I also realize if I don't, if I look the other way, I could allow, he could begin, I mean, children learn, they could begin to realize, oh, so if I do this, I'll never get punished. So I'll still do it, but we have to have proper conversations and sit and actually discuss and um, just affirm him a little bit more. That's what, I've, that's what has worked for me. Okay, thank you. I think I'll do that because I've, I've realized I actually don't do any affirmation after that. No, I'm also mm. angry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you need to cool down before you do the affirmation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other question? And comments are also welcome, ladies. So, <laughs> or something that stood out for you. Yeah. Another question for me, for the do's and don'ts, do you now continue adding your, your list? Because as you continue, okay, you'll have what is sort of your standards. Then I, probably as yeah. more are coming, that means you'd have to add as many as you continue, right? I, for me, okay, what has worked for me is when they were toddlers, it was different. As they grow, I change them now. I have a teenager and a preteen. It's very different. You find that, in fact, I think all the all the regulations I have now in my house are around gadgets. Um, so as they grow, I guess unless your age gaps are very big, then you need to have you know what, some that cut across. But because my children are very close in age, you'll find the ones that whatever we are agreed upon applies to all of them. So the ones I needed to lay down when they were younger, like five years old or six years old, I mean, I, I guess that they learned and we are not struggling in that area anymore. So then I, we, we come up with new ones, you know, around respect, around uh, talking back, especially now as they get there. Uh, as they get to teenager, I remember having a discussion with my daughter about doors. I told her the day you bang the door, I remove it. It is my house, I can remove the door and you will do nothing about it. So, I mean, just that awareness that as they grow, you then need to shift what is applicable to them at that age and change the guidelines, the rules and the consequences accordingly. Um, now, at teen and preteen, I'm not spanking anymore. So what are the consequences? Because then we're not spanking. So what are the consequences then for your actions? Well, before I said it's one kiboko, now I'm not saying one kiboko, <laughs> now it's what is it? What is it that you lose or what privilege you lose or how are you, or how are you punished? So yeah, it's adapting them to the age. Okay, thank yeah. you. We have, um, Beryl has sent uh, some messages. She says very insightful. I like the interactivity. And Anjenga also has sent a message saying, very well presented. Thank you, Catherine, for sharing great insights. Um, Rosemary, do you have a question? I can see you're at work and that's, <laughs> it's so nice that you're there and, and still connecting with us. Oh, she's hanging. Yeah, Rosemary says very, very with, you know, many ease, very, oh. very informative. Um, Hannah, Hannah, you'd like to say something? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Catherine. I think what has stood out for me is on emotional um, intelligence, about self-management. Yeah. And um, it has encouraged me because I've been seeking out for help and uh, it seems I'm on the right path. Yeah, oh, wow. that has greatly encouraged me. Um, yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Hannah, for that. And, and when Hannah said that in the discussion, I was telling her we should like almost have a discussion just on self-management as moms. Yeah, yeah because I, I need it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, because I think there is moods we've never had that 
corona is exposing or you know just part of us that has been hidden that is quite is being unleashed you know yeah um I, my, my kids told my hubby the other day that you're being grumpy oh. yeah so so then you become grumpy if there's such a word you know because you're like these children gosh i keep telling them just what you said that gosh you're so lucky we are your parents you kids you know yeah <laughs> yeah yeah but I like and, that. And, and I keep saying it's a learning journey. And one of the things we do a lot as moms is we beat ourselves up when things don't go right or when, you know, or even when you lose it and you yell at your children in a certain way and you really beat yourself up. But for mm -hmm. me, one of the things I believe is if I mess up, I have learned a lesson. If I need to apologize, I apologize. And we need to learn to apologize to our children when we do something that's not right. And we move on. So I don't stay there, that I, you know, get up, move on, and learn from that mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved your last point about as the children are growing, the discipline, the how to discipline also changes. Because when you are growing up, the discipline yeah. remained the same. You're beaten until however old you are. It didn't at change. 16. <laughs> yeah, at 16, you're still being beaten yeah. by your parent. Which we are, we are, like you said with the other gentleman, we are still healing some wounds. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we project that to the children. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm so thankful. And um, Catherine, this was a wonderful presentation, very insightful. I know we are going to go back, um, listen to the recordings. Uh, I think for me, I'll send the presentation to those, the, uh, your presentation to those who have attended. Uh, so yeah. that they are able to go through it well. So thank you for the ladies who have made time today. We are fewer than normal, um, and yet it was such a heavy topic. So may the Lord honor your, your coming, and may he help you raise your children well, children who are well taken care of, and children who then um, also are caring. Rosemary, I've seen you switched on. Did you want to say something? Okay, thank you. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> it was an accident. Okay, so thank you, Catherine. Thank you for coming. May you raise your children um, as Jesus was and every other mother represented here, Carol, Hannah, Felistas, Anne, Beryl, and Rosemary, may we, and myself, may we raise children who are able to honor the Lord and who are uh, blessed before God and before man. May the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful um, two weeks before we see you again. And remember next time we are having Bridget coming to share her life story about how she underwent and overcame um, spousal abuse. Okay. okay, so we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. May the Lord bless and keep you. Thank you very much. Yeah, bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.